I'm Maggie Sailing. I'm with Startup Envy. I'm the Communications Director and the Chief of Staff and happy to be bringing this information to you. It's a very important part of your pitch deck. It's something that investors are going to be very interested in, but it's something that a founder should be interested in too. Knowing your numbers, your TAM, SAM, and SOM can give you a roadmap for where your company's going. So what are they? What is TAM, SAM, and SOM? TAM is the total addressable market. And that is the worldview. This is your industry and all of the money that it generates worldwide. SAM is the serviced addressable market. And you can go one of two ways with this. You can have a geographical location, which I think is a good way for a startup to go. Or you can do the subset of the TAM that is the particular sector that you're in. SAM is a smaller number than TAM. It's usually one to 10% of the TAM. And then for your SOM, this is your target for how much you think you can make out of the SAM. And that is also going to be a smaller percentage. Having an unrealistic percentage, thinking that you're going to get 100% of the serviced available market is not realistic. How do we get to these numbers? Take a look on the left side, you can see I have TAM, SAM, and SOM in these sort of um, stacked circles. This is the easiest way to depict your TAM, SAM, and SOM. It's very easy for investors to understand it. And because one is a subset of the other, it makes a lot of sense getting down to the small percentage that you're going to try to penetrate. Why do we need these numbers? Well, because an investor wants to understand your marketplace. The TAM, gives the upside. This is the potential if everything were to go right. Um, oftentimes people say that if you're a utility, then your TAM, your total addressable market is 100% because you're the only game in town. This is not realistic for most startups. The TAM also divides marketplaces into different sectors. So there's the transportation sector, there's the energy sector. And these are very broad categories. So in doing TAM, you could do the whole sector representation, or you could do, if it's a big number, you could still do uh, your particular piece of that pie. Then when we get to the SAM, it gives context to what your potential is in the next 10 years. It can be a geographical area, it could be your whole state, it could be your country. If there's huge potential, it could be smaller than a country. It could just be your local area, your whole state. The SOM is a realistic view of what you want to do. It's what you can obtain in say one to three years. So how much penetration are you going to get into the SOM in a three-year period. The way I said that it can help you with your goals is, you know, you're not going to get there in the first year in all likelihood, but if you have it as a goal in three years, then an investor that's looking at your business understands what your trajectory is going to be and then what the whole potential can be by looking at the TAM. Well, how do we calculate these things? And it's not easy. When you do it top down, is there's a tendency for people to want to just pick a percentage as what you can attain with no actual basis for that happening. But there is free information out there from the UN, the OECD, the World Bank. You can get numbers on total sector marketplace numbers that are published worldwide. From there, you would apply filters like geographic filters and demographic filters to those numbers to get to your SAM and SOM. It's hard to actually apply those numbers. That takes a certain amount of research in itself, but you can get to numbers that will suffice as TAM, SAM, and SOM. Another method for creating TAM, SAM, and SOM is bottom up. A lot of investors prefer a bottom up design, but it's very easy to underestimate what your marketplace is going to be doing it that way. Here you start with your first market. Let's say that it's Reno and Las Vegas and you're going to open up a fast food market. Depending on what you're serving, you could have SAM as all of the fast food in Reno and Las Vegas. And it's very easy to find fast food for the US, which would be your TAM, or fast food for the entire world, which is not realistic. It would take a long time to get to where you were penetrating in other markets. So if you did TAM as fast food for the United States and SAM as fast food for 
Las Vegas and Reno, you would be well on your way. And then you could do your sum based on whether you're doing burgers or chicken or some other fast casual type of approach and with demographic research and with talking to people. Bottom up, you start with your local and you do customer validation. You go out and talk to people and then you extrapolate up. The last way to do it is through external research. You can pay research firms to actually go out and do this market research. It costs a lot of money and it becomes stale after a certain period of time. So large companies will use these research firms to do that sort of research if they're going to go into new fields or bring out a new product. It's not really for the startup community. Let's take an example. Okay, so this is Uber. And Uber, I have actual numbers from um, their 2007 pitch deck. So right now, the transportation industry is 5.7 trillion worldwide, but transportation is a broad category and it includes sea, rail, train, um, and air freight. And these were not things that Uber was going after. So for their SOM, they selected the taxi and limousine market in the United States, which was 4.2 billion in 2007. And then for some, their uh, pitch deck kind of was wishy-washy. I wouldn't recommend doing it this way because the best case is the one that you really want to talk about. You do want to be realistic. Uh, so they said their best case, they would be the market leader and they would get $1 billion in yearly revenue. Their worst case, though, was that they were just a private car service in San Francisco where they were starting. So their first two cities that they intended to go after were New York and San Francisco. Well, we all know what happened with them. So Uber's revenue in 2019 was 14.15 billion. And they expanded. They weren't just ride hailing. They expanded to Uber Eats, to Uber Freight, Uber X, and Uber Mobility. So they really sort of undershot uh, what they could do, but it's a great story. So another example we have is Airbnb. Now Airbnb is still private, um, but Airbnb was creating a new marketplace. They were creating new availability for overnight stays by engaging with regular people. And so in order to try to paint a picture of what that marketplace would look like, they started with what was currently happening in overnight stays. So the 1.9 billion trips were booked worldwide. That was their TAM. Budget and online trips, because they figured that theirs would be less expensive, were uh, 532 million trips. That was their SAM. And they figured that they could get 10.6 million out of that. So taking it one step further, then they took the number of trips that was their target times their average fee, which was uh, $20 on a three night stay at a $70 night place. And it worked out to revenue estimates of 200 million between 2008 and 2011. So they were projecting forward to get to 200 million. And now Airbnb, their revenue for 2017 was estimated at 2.6 billion. So here they paint a very easy to understand picture of what their marketplace could be. Marketplaces are a little bit hard to depict. So here is uh, another version from our friends from Boom Startup. Here they take the three different areas that they want to create a marketplace around and they're going to take a percentage of the action. So they're trying to get to how much business is possible and then they'll get a percentage of it. So if you look at custom clothing design, they estimated their SAM down to be 32 billion in the US. And the, for custom clothing manufacturing is 27.4 billion and for custom clothing e-tailing, 24 billion. So then you would take this and massage it against what your percentage of the transaction is gonna be, or if you have a flat fee, whatever that number it is. And then you can predict what your income is gonna be in three years or five years, depending on what percentage of that you think you can make. Now here we have another example from a startup. 
that was really just doing customer validation and trying to figure out what their market could be. So they went the bottom up approach. They went out and did research. So the premise for their company is that they were going to rent professional sports jerseys in five of the major sports fields. So they were going to start with New York City. So their TAM was how many people watch the five major sports on TV in the US, and that's 150 million Americans. Then their target is for New York City. So they figured out how many New Yorkers are watching the five major sports, and that was 11 million people. And then they had a premise before they went out to Yankee Stadium to do their research. And the premise was that season ticket holders were going to be male and they were going to be under 30 years old. And they would be the core of their customer. And they would probably want to rent a season long jersey. And they made it enticing because say your player got traded away, you could trade in your jersey. And they would, you know, make sure that it got cleaned and your new one was cleaned before it went back out. So they made it very flexible because, you know, New Yorkers very rabid about their sports. Uh, then they went to a game and they talked to people and they discovered that women would also be part of their demographic and that a lot of them were interested in just renting one jersey for an event. Say they didn't have season tickets, but when they went to a game, they wanted to really embrace the whole spirit of the game. And so they wanted to have a player jersey when they went there. So they developed a second branch of their company that was one-time rentals. So naturally the one-time rental fee is higher and the season long fee with the exchange possibility is a little bit more. So when they did their survey at the game, they found out that 11.7% of the people said that they were very strongly interested in partaking in their service. So here is what they presented. And now we're gonna take a look at how a stacked Venn diagram makes it a little bit easier to understand. So on the left, you have the diagram and on the right, you have the explanation. So there's 150 million Americans that are watching the five major sports. That's the TAM. The SAM was 11 million of them watching in New York City. And then the SOM is based on the 11.7% that showed a strong interest, which works out to 1.3 million people. But this isn't telling us anything about the revenue. So how do they figure that? You take another slide and we'll do it sort of like Airbnb did. So if we figure that our percentages for the two different lines, the rentals one time versus the rentals for the season, it's gonna be a 60-40 split. We know what our fees are. We can actually you know, figure out what the fee should be in order to make the number that we want. But, but these seem like reasonable fees when we did the survey with the people in the stadium. So one-time fee of $50 and a season-long fee of $250. Massage it against the percentages and you come up with $169 million in three years. So that was their target. This is something that's really easy for an investor to understand that will be at 169 million in three years. So based on what their investment is, they can tell how much they're gonna make back. That's what investors wanna know. How much am I gonna make back and when am I gonna get it? So all of this research uh, can be very daunting and you have resources though. In the state of Nevada, because the university system is public and is funded by our taxes, uh, they have a certain duty to help the public when the public wants help. So they make their business librarians available to the public. So I have here the names of the two people that can help the general public with market research and also with IP research. So if you have an idea for something, you think you can patent it, then you can go to the engineering librarian at UNR or um, Patrick Griffiths can also do the patent work down there at UNLV. And they can help you look up whether a patent exists for something that you're considering. On the other hand, any of these people can help you with market research. Uh, the two different universities subscribe to different databases. So I actually recommend that you contact all of them and ask them how they can help you. Um, the research can extend into doing demographic research. Uh, so if you think that you want to know how many people in Nevada 
are between the ages of 30 and 50 that make at least $60,000 a year, they can do research like that as well. And that can help you arrive at how big your market is. So I would say go ahead and contact these people. They're there to help you and uh, they'll do it for free. And you may have to pay if you want some stuff printed. If you want reports emailed to you, that's usually free. And if you want very specific information like the email addresses of all those people that were between 30 and 50 making at least $60,000 a year, you may have to pay for that kind of information. So that's it for Tam, Sam, and Sam. And we'll see you next time.